are going to have some fun here this morning as we uh, continue to dive into learning more and experiencing more of, of God, His love, His presence, His Son, Jesus. We're going to be going into the Gospel of Matthew because we're working our way through this Gospel and we're in chapter 21. But before we jump into it, I just want to talk a moment about prayer because we're going to pray here as we continue on with our worship in this service, but, but also because we're gradually approaching our 21 days of prayer that we do in August every year. And we spend, yeah, thank you, excited on, on a little bit of prayer, a little bit of excitement over this side of the room today, right side. I, I don't know what that means yet, um, but I'm liking it. I'm going to start standing over here. Um, but yeah, we spend 21 days with this kind of emphasis on like kind of kicking off the school year and into this remainder of the year with, with an emphasis on prayer and just intentionality of how do we build some more of this into our life. And um, I mean, it's such a big and important deal. I'm learning so much about prayer right now. And frankly, it's kind of an answer to prayer. As I've been praying, I know that I've, my prayer life's been a little anemic and there's so much more to it. And it's, it's really interesting because I think we tend to think about prayer and we either think of it as like, well, it's important, but it doesn't totally do anything. You have that like conflict where you're like, it's really important because God says to pray, but I'm not sure it really actually does anything. And or you have people that are like, prayer totally works. Like, do you know that we have people at Bayside who are our prayer team? And not only are they our prayer team, they're actually our prayer and fasting team. Like they pray and fast, some of them every single day. That's crazy to me. I'm not on the prayer and fasting team. Is, should I admit that? I don't know if I should or not. Um, I'm not. But I mean, it's like hardcore to me. But it's like there is this absolute like conviction like prayer works. And I want part of 21 Days of Prayer is us all kind of taking a step a little bit closer to seeing how prayer works, the greatness and power of this God that's so beautiful that we pray to, and how we draw near to him. Because so often the problem that we have with prayer is that prayer is going to do something that I appreciate as opposed to me drawing nearer to knowing the God I'm praying to. And that is very often God's attitude in prayer. His first priority is not doing all the crazy, weird stuff we ask him to do. Right? Come on. You admit it. There's, you've asked for some weird, crazy stuff. I mean, if God answered all your weird prayers, who would you be married to right now? <laughs> Somebody different, probably. Uh, right? I mean... Better or for worse, um, it's, it's, he, does, he ignores a lot of stuff. Who knows where you'd be living, where you'd be working. I mean, all kinds of weird things would be different. If your children could pray, how different would you be? If all their prayers were answered, right? Some of you would have like a third foot in your forehead because kids pray weird prayers. Some of you'd be dead, right? I mean, so, you know, I just, God doesn't answer everything willy-nilly. The whole point is, how do we draw near to know our God better? I mean, that's a big part of this 21 days of prayer. And so... Uh, it is just a big deal. So I just want us to take a moment to pray together and to pray for what God wants to talk to us about today because he absolutely wants to speak to each and every one of us. It's part of the greatness of why we, it's cool we come together as a group, as a church, this body of Christ, but God also wants to take each and every one of us right where we're at and show something that we need to see in who he is. So let's take a moment and just pray together to prepare ourselves for what he wants to say. Father, we are so grateful to be here. And Lord, right now, I just want to pray the prayer I know to pray, which is for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done on earth right here as it is in heaven. Lord, that you would just bring your kingdom into this cafeteria, that this would be your kingdom, we would be your people, that we would draw near to our king and our God and our Lord and that we would know you and we would love you. So Lord, Speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Speak from your word. We pray this all, Jesus, in your great name. Amen. Amen. I've been uh, reading a couple of books, and one that I've talked about a few times that's called How to Pray by Pete Gregg. If you haven't bought it already, I highly recommend it. It's so good, and I'll, there's many of you that have done it, and I'm hearing the same testimony. It's, it's outstanding, and it's just, it helps push you along on something that you kind of feel like you know what you're doing already, or you, you kind of gave up on it, and it, it kicks my butt a little bit. But I, I started reading his companion book this last week, which is called How to Hear God. So you got How to Pray, and then you got one that's like How to Hear. And uh, it's, it's a great book, and this week I was, I, I was reading this part of the, of the book right here where it says this. There we go. It says, by training ourselves to hear God's voice where it's easiest in the Bible, we gradually learn to hear his voice everywhere else as well. 
When we root ourselves in Scripture, the whole of creation becomes God's mouthpiece. And I thought that was a really fascinating picture to be reminded of how we come to Scripture because that's the clearest and easiest way to hear what God wants to say to us, which is why we study the Bible. That's why every Sunday, that's what we're going to get into. It's what we're looking at. It's why we spend our time there, and we encourage everybody to read it and study it on their own throughout the week, because that's the easiest way that you're going to hear God's voice. But he says, as you get to know God and you get to know his voice, I love he says, you're also going to begin to hear God other places. You're going to hear God all over creation. You're going to hear God in other people. You're going to hear God in what you see in that, some of that beauty around the world that you might see. You're going to get to hear God speak and hear what God has to say in some incredible moments. And so we're going to take some time to dive into Scripture so that we can hear and understand God's Word for us. So let's look at Matthew chapter 21, 12. Last week we talked about Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. He came in that really kind of epic moment of riding in on a donkey. And as he was riding in, people were cheering and people were going crazy and they were all shouting things. You remember they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You guys remember that? Okay, good. So here's the thing. Because because I'm telling you a story about a parade and a riot breaking out, that's all about submarine. You have to get a little bit animated. Are you ready? You're, you're going to have to participate because I want you got to have the right mindset to understand what God's talking about here. So get ready. We're going to repeat after me. I want you to yell out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Woo, are you getting excited? Yeah, it's like... The king just strolled into the cafeteria. We're all like, oh my gosh, he's here. Like everybody's excited and they're waving branches and they're throwing their coats in front of them. And right, I mean, people are going crazy because they think he is, he is right into Jerusalem and he's going to ride right up to the capital. He's about to take over. He's going to change the world, but really he's going to change our world. He's going to change my life. It's going to become better. There's going to be no more taxes. He's going to get rid of these Roman oppressors. I know, so now I'm speaking your language. Right? All, I mean, all this stuff, that's what they're thinking. He's the new king. And we didn't read it, but if you look in Luke 19, uh, as it tells the story uh, of Jesus riding in, it's really fascinating. Everybody is cheering. Everybody's like, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he says, he rides up and he gets to the point where he can see Jerusalem. And it says that Jesus begins to weep. Everybody is excited. But Jesus brought his rain cloud. Jesus is like, this is not a celebration. This is a point of mourning. This is a point of sadness. This is a point of grief. And he goes on to say, at this moment, the city of Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem have missed what's really happening. Even though what they're saying about him is right. But what they're expecting from him is wrong. They've got the right title, they've got the right proclamation, they've even got the right enthusiasm, but they have entirely the wrong expectations of what he's going to do. And he says that because they've missed us, they're blind to us, they haven't listened, they haven't heard all the things that he has been saying, that this missed opportunity isn't just like a one-time miss, like, oh no, they missed him riding in, so they didn't get it. He means the last three years. He's been there doing miracles, he's been there speaking, he's been there teaching, and they haven't believed in what he said. They haven't trusted him. And now this point in time is coming and they're going to miss the king that really rode in. And he says it's, it's going to lead to the entire destruction of the city, which is going to happen almost, almost exactly 40 years later when the Romans do come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and they destroy the temple, they destroy the whole thing. The nation, not the people, but the nation of Israel will cease to exist until 1948, right? I mean, it's crazy. And she's saying all because they didn't recognize the king when he came in or recognized the truth about the king as he came in. And so now we come to this point where Jesus has ridden in, and this is his mood, this is his mindset. He rides all the way into the city with everybody around them shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Oh, good, you guys are with me. Good job. They're all still excited. Everybody else is still freaking out. Jesus is like, oh, this is a train wreck. He rides into the temple, right? And we pick this up. He enters the temple, and he began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. 
the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of the religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of the literal picture of what's going on here, right? This is a, a model of the temple, right? It doesn't exist. We don't have any photographs of it, but here's a model of what it would have looked like. And this giant courtyard on the outskirts there is the part that Jesus has entered where all these money changers are. And just to understand kind of the, 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 what you're looking at here, in the center where you have that big building that's really tall, that's the kind of the temple proper. Outside of that, you start to hit the courts. In the center of that temple in the innermost room is a place called the Holy of Holies. And it's a place where God's presence was supposed to dwell. It was the only place on earth where God's presence was supposed to dwell in the special sense. And it was a place that only one person could enter one time out of the year. The high priest could go in there and offer one sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation once a year. That was it, the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, was. It's where the mercy seat on top of the Ark, which is called where God's presence was supposed to dwell. Outside of that was a place called the Holy Place, and that's where the priests could go in, and they could do certain work and different things that were there that were kept there that were part of their worship. And then on the court outside of that, there was a court called the, the Courtyard for Men, which was the Jewish men alone were allowed to get there. And each step of the way, you're kind of drawing closer and closer to God. Then outside of that was the courtyard, they called it of the women, where it was men and women, but the women could come that close. And then outside of that courtyard is when you get into the big courtyard again, that was called the Courtyard of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were the ones who were the furthest away from being able to draw near to God. And so you have all these kind of layers to this temple of how close you were allowed to get to the presence of God. Jesus walks into this outer area, and that's where he sees all of this business going on. Now, it's all, you might call it, church-related business, because they're all there for Passover. They're all there to, to buy and purchase an animal so that they can sacrifice it for themselves and for their families and their, for their community as a part of the rites of the Old Testament that they're supposed to do. So it's not like this is a fraudulent business in, in essence, how they were managing it may have been, but the purpose was this was a service as a part of how people could come here and worship because you had pilgrims literally on a pilgrimage from all across uh, northern Africa and southern Europe and through the Middle East, people traveling hundreds of miles, if not more, to come and they aren't going to all be packing a sheep with them. Right? I mean, trying to try imagine walking and traveling that far by boat, and you got to bring all your animals, and there's up to literally millions of these pilgrims that have come into Jerusalem. So you've got these people who are selling these animals because they've raised them for this purpose, so people can come and just buy their animals. So in essence, it's all good business. In fact, it's all church-sponsored. The church leaders, the pastors and religious leaders have all said, we need you guys here. This is the most efficient way to do this, the most efficient way to service all of these people who are coming to this temple. And so Jesus isn't necessarily anti what they're doing, though there may be an attitude of how they're doing it, but what he's really anti is where they're doing it at. They're doing it in the temple itself. They're in the very place where people were supposed to be able to draw near to God, closer to God, to show their loyalty to God, to do their sacrifice, to be a place, as he put it, of prayer. So if you think of it this way, the temple is meant to equal God's presence. This is how people drew near to God. The closest you could get to God, even when they were far away and they would pray, they would face towards Jerusalem to pray. And the temple was for a place for the atoning sacrifice and for prayer. Right? You came with a sacrifice that was a lamb, or if you were poor, it was doves. And you were going to kill those, that lamb or those doves as a sacrifice for your sin. And it was a recognition that when you kill that animal, that the, well, the animal was dying, but you were the one who was supposed to die. It was your sin that has separated you from God. And when you're separated from God, you're separated from the, the creator of life. And when you're separated from the creator of life, that's called death. It's the natural consequence of being separated from God. And these animals were being killed as demonstration of my, this was, my sin should be equal, my death, but this lamb is atoning for me, which means it's covering over my sin so that God is not going to strike me down. Instead, my sin is covered. 
And then when your sin was covered, then you could step in front of God. Then you could pray. Then you could draw near to him as your sin had been taken care of in that moment. And so they're meant to be able to draw near to God, to come close to God. I mean, this is all part of how the system is, is working. And Jesus sees what's being done. He sees the noise. He sees the animals for sale. He sees all the activity, right? He's here. If you've ever been to like an auction yard, like there's people yelling, right? If it's like going walking through, uh, you know, any kind of big business where everybody is, you know, exchanging and talking. I mean, it's noisy and loud. It's the opposite of what we have in here, right? Which is a place of worship. We want it to be quiet at times, right? We want to be able to listen. We want to be able to hear what God has to say. We want to be able to step into his presence. But this is chaos all around people. And so Jesus sees this, and he is, he's angry. I mean, he's already walked into Jerusalem sad, grieved. Now he sees this, and he's angry, and he's chasing all these people out, and he's chasing the money changers, and he's chasing the animals. Like John tells us he actually puts together a whip when he does this. Not a leather whip, though, like we often think, like Indiana Jones carried. Like, not that kind of a whip. It was actually just a whip of cords. It wouldn't have had any snap to it. It would have just been, well, probably more for emphasis. It would have moved moved the animals along. But he's not being soft-spoken here. He's not being calm here. He's not being quiet. He's not even being like, hey, you guys need to go. He's flipping over tables. That's a pretty exciting version of Jesus, isn't it? I mean, if I could, I would demonstrate, but these tables are really hard to flip over. Um, Right? I mean, it's like a, wow. I mean, Jesus is like, this is a big deal. It's a huge deal to Jesus that you guys have turned this place where people are supposed to approach God and you've made it this den of robbers instead of a place of prayer, a place for people to find God, right? Because he said, look, that's the, the significance of this place. That's the goal. This is God's design. This is the whole point is that you can come to him and, and enter into his house and pray, that you can have a conversation with God because, you know, this idea in prayer isn't, we're not coming so much just to ask God for stuff in this case, we're coming to actually encounter Him. It's the very thing that we want to experience is we come together as a body, as a people in church. It's the same that we want when we come into God's Word and, and Scripture is to encounter and experience the love of God, the power of God, the presence of God. But I was thinking about this this week. In fact, after reading that book that I was telling you about that I quoted at the beginning on how to hear God, I was, I was reading this section where it talks about how, you know, one, one practice is to take just a couple of verses, a couple of verses and to read them slowly, and then to just dwell on them and pray to ask God to speak to you through them. And to be honest, I don't do that very often. I like to read lots of things. I like to read a lot of text. I like to read chapters. I like to get context. I like to understand it and really wrestle with it with my brain. I really want to know what it's about in that sense. But I don't often stop and read it slowly and meditate on it and ask that I could really hear what God wants to say in the quiet. And so I was thinking about it. In fact, on this particular day, I, I don't know why, but my stomach was upset and I was feeling nauseous. So I came home and our air conditioning was broken at our office. So I was laying on our couch, uh, which is never a great idea to be laying on a couch in the middle of the afternoon and not fall asleep. And so I was laying on the couch and I was reading this and I was thinking, like, you know, I should meditate on this passage. And as I was meditating on it, I may have nodded off for a moment. And then I was like, I suddenly woke up, and it was one of those crazy moments where I was woke up thinking about the passage, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'd never thought about something. There's a couple of things that just had never stuck out to me, and I started, I had to get up, got out my phone, wrote it down on my notes, put it back down, I laid back down, and I was thinking again, because again, my stomach wasn't feeling good, and I'm pretty sure I fell asleep again. Um, but then I woke up again, and I'm like, again, I had another one of these little like brain moments where I'm just like, oh my gosh, like there's something else I'd never thought. I mean, I'm super familiar with this passage. But one of the things that I never really thought that much about that popped into my head was, you know, Jesus drives out the money changers and the merchants. That part I got. But I had never really paid attention or even remembered that the blind and the lame came in. Now, this isn't unusual for Jesus to be around blind and lame people, but I never thought about it in this story. Here he is in the temple driving out the money changers. He's driving out all the hardworking religious people that have approval to be there. The religious leaders have said, we want you there. Come on in. Be in this place. But Jesus drives all those guys out. He drives them all out of the temple. He drives them all out of the room. He drives them all out of the space. Hey, Kathy, 
the pizza guys here and would love for you to grab those real quick. I know. Thanks for being early. I appreciate it. That's Growth Track Pizza, by the way. Just saying real quickly while we're, may as well advertise. Um, if you want to come and have lunch with us, we'll be doing Growth Track number three. Discover your purpose. It's going to be good. So Jesus, in this moment, drives out these people, but then he welcomes in the blind and the lame. So imagine, remember that picture of the temple? That big courtyard, he's driving all these people out, chasing animals out, money's flying everywhere, tables are turned over, and it's like as all of the like respectable people, in a sense, get run out of there, all of a sudden, the lame and the blind start like creeping in. Like, I don't know how the lame make their way in. This is improv. Though I don't know if they have help. I don't know if they're on crutches and they're like limping their way in, or if they get their legs don't work at all and they're like crawling in. I don't know. I just know that they know the story of Jesus well enough that when they hear there's Jesus is around, they all want to get to him, whether they have help or not. And you've got all of these handicapped people crawling, limping, feeling their way into the temple, trying to listen to the sound of his voice and get close enough to Jesus because they know this, that this Jesus is a healer. And he has this sort of attitude that says, I'll heal anybody, and I'll heal everybody, and I'll do it for free, and I don't care where they're coming from, and I don't care what their problem is. And it's radical in this sense that that temple was a place for people to come to, yeah, to bring their, their sacrifice for sin, but there were certain people that they didn't allow in. There were certain people they didn't think were, were, could come in because God had cursed them. And if you were somebody in that day and age who was blind and or lame, that you were looked at somebody who God had cursed you with blindness and lame, which meant that you probably weren't a good person. God only let bad things happen to bad people. In fact, if you were a good person, you were probably wealthy and you were healthy. If you had those blessings on your life, it sure looked like you had God's blessing. And let's face it, it still looks that way to our eyes, doesn't it? That's how we tend to think. We can't help it a little bit to go like, man, God has blessed them with health. Bless them with wealth. I mean, it's wonderful things to have. They're good things to have. But people who are lame or hurt or injured or handicapped, they kind of go like, well, God's been holding back some blessing on them. Maybe it's because of something they've done. And Jesus has this exact opposite attitude, which is like, just come on in. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have watched the, the show The Chosen. Have you guys seen The Chosen? It's on Amazon right now. It's a story. They're doing a great job, as well as you can do, I think. I mean, it's not like they're reading the Bible. They're actually telling a story and developing characters, but telling the story of Jesus. And this last week, they're right on the cusp of this story, but they're just talking about some of the people that Jesus allowed to come to him. And it's always the very last people that society wants to be around. He wants everybody. There's nobody unworthy. There's nobody that can't or shouldn't or that they don't want to have come to Jesus. He welcomes them all. And I love this, that in this moment, as he's thrown over tables and turning chairs, he welcomes these people and he heals them. And you remember what it said the leaders did? That the Pharisees saw the miracles he did and they heard the praises the children were all crying out and they were indignant, right? Which is just a fancy word for they were angry and they were offended, they were angry and offended because Jesus is doing miracles. You better get that and tell them this is the best sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> he is saying, look, this is, this is awesome, right? This is one of those incredible moments. But these leaders are missing it, right? They're missing because in their heart, in their mind, they're like, there's a certain way that it's supposed to work. It's supposed to follow a fit in a certain box, that God's going to be limited in some way, shape, or form that we're limited. And Jesus keeps bursting outside of all those because his main thing is come to God and don't let anything stop you. Draw near to God because God wants to draw near to you no matter who you are. I mean, this isn't new to the New Testament, but let me give you a New Testament passage on it. James 4.8 says this, Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. I mean, that's worth just stopping for a moment, right? That's where we all live. We all live in a place where, man, our loyalty is so easily divided between this God who calls us to serve and follow him and the world around us and the promises it makes to us of how good life can be if we have more of it or the promise of God that says how good life will be if you have more of me. And there's always this tension. And he says, 
Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. Your loyalty is divided. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. And I hadn't thought of framing this this way until this morning. I was actually watching something uh, from a, a lady who's a missionary in China and was talking about, not this passage, but just talking about when we approach God, the language of the Bible, the language of the New Testament in particular, talks about encountering his life and his resurrection power. But to experience the resurrection, you have to die. And he isn't talking about you dying physically. That's not the problem. The problem is us dying emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, in our ego, in our pride, in our sense of control. But I think ultimately it's in our sense of ownership. Is my life my own? Do I have a right to my own life? Or is God the one who has given it to me and it's all a gift? And there is a very real sense where James is simply talking in detail about what it means to come and experience God, to experience his love, to experience his joy, to experience his forgiveness it means some part of me that feels like I am in control and this is my life. That side has to die and recognize I'm not in control. and My life is not my own. It's all a gift from God, including his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his grace. And he's describing that God's desire is to draw near to us and his desire is also to lift you up in honor. But it requires us to take steps in that direction. If, if you were with us last week, we talked about it in this way, that the idea of believing is to relax into the goodness of God. And I've been thinking about this all week. I'm not letting this go for a little while because it's playing with my head a little bit. But I love this picture that to believe is to relax in the goodness of God of God. If I really believe in God, if I really believe his promises, if I really believe in Jesus and who he is and what he has done for me, if I believe in his love, then I have this ability to relax and know that it's not up to me. It's not on me. It isn't without a requirement from me. But I have to relax into the goodness of God, which begs the question, what exactly is the goodness of God all about? And I'm just going to show you a couple of verses. And honestly, if you've been already sleeping, which is totally okay, I understand, um, pay attention to this part. Because honestly, if you can understand these next few verses, if you get this, the whole, and I'm not exaggerating, the whole Bible will become understandable. You will understand the main storyline. You will understand what you need to understand about what is going on. Why does God deal with people the way he deals with people? This is the key piece. And it goes all the way back to the story of Exodus when he is having a conversation with Moses, where God is, and it looks a little, starts like this. Mo, the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. And this isn't actually the message, but I can't pass it up. You know how awesome it is when God knows your name? Or more, maybe accurately, how awesome it is when God says your name. One of the things I just encourage you in as you approach God is to listen to how God calls you because God wants to call you by name. He knows you by name. He wants you to hear it. And when you hear God say your name, there's more that changes inside of our hearts than I know how to describe with words. To be known by God is an amazing thing. Moses responded, because you know me, Show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. All right? So here's the promise. Here's what we're about to see. Here's what God's going to reveal. He's going to reveal his goodness. It's going to pass for Moses. He says, I will call out my name, which is Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. All right. So we're about to step in. You ready? This is the part. This is the big part. This is where God is going to reveal his goodness. This is the thing when we talk about believing, relax into the goodness of God. This is what it's all about. All right, here it is. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh the Lord. Now, I got to clarify something real quickly. I know. Hold on. Don't read ahead. 
When it's Lord in all caps, capital L-O-R-D right there, all caps. In, so the, the translators do that so you'll understand that when it, when it says that in the Hebrew, it's God saying his formal name, which is, in, if you read the Hebrew and sounded out, it would look like Yahweh. So this is the New Living Translation, and for whatever reason, they decided to give you a little bit of both today. But when you read just, if it were all in Hebrew, it would say, then Yahweh passed in front of Moses calling out Yahweh, Yahweh. And in Hebrew, if you want to emphasize something that's like really, really good or really, really great or a lot or more, you just repeat it. So if you like, I came to your house and you gave me an amazing dinner, I'd be like, that was a good, good dinner. I wouldn't be like, it's really good because they have no word for really. They're just like, they repeat, good, good. When God says his name, I am, it gets written, I am the I am. God's name is I am. If you want to know God's formal name, his first name, I am. Now, you can think about that for a while. It's kind of fun. But then he repeats it. He's not just I am. He's I am the I am. Okay, too much fun there. We can't go there. That's not the point. But I want you to see that. I am the I am. This is God himself, the God of compassion and mercy. And I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. This is God's goodness. This is the full picture of God's goodness. It is a fascinating and difficult concept for us as people who are not good to understand the goodness of God. It's one of the great steps for every single one of us is to come to a place where God is God and we are ready to experience the truth of the great God and we aren't the God ourselves. To understand that His goodness is difficult for us because we have tendencies toward <laughs> sin Rebellion and iniquity, which is like saying betrayal. That we aren't good like God is good. And God says, look, I am a God who was merciful and compassionate. Right? Merciful meaning I don't want to give you what you deserve. As in you did something wrong, you deserve to be punishment. I don't want to punish you. I'd rather give you something good instead of something bad. Compassionate, right? I care about you. I actually feel your pain. I hurt for you. I have sympathy for you. Slow to anger. Do you know how slow God is to anger? He's amazingly slow. If, think if God had your temper. Everybody would be dead. Everybody ever cut you off in traffic, they're gone. Right? I mean, we'd all be gone. He is slow to anger and filled with this unfailing love. He just can't stop loving. And on top of that, he's loyal. He is faithful. He is committed to a thousand generations. Isn't that wild? To a thousand generations. I mean, just think if someone in the last thousand generations of your family loved God and God loved them, that just trickles down. Kind of interesting considering that. And then you look at this next part, there's but. And this, this might be the biggest but in the Bible right here. This is a big one because it's right in the middle of God's goodness. Right? It's right in the middle of God's goodness. It's splitting it. Here's my love and my mercy and my forgiveness, but I do not excuse the guilty. That's called tension, right? That's called a personal conflict, right? That calls God's got two competing desires in himself when he looks at sinful human beings. He loves them. He wants to forgive us. He absolutely must punish us for our sin. Because he's just. He has to give justice or he would become an unjust God. And if justice goes out the window at the level of heaven and the universe, then our world gets even crazier worse than it could ever possibly be. 
we know that justice is important. We know that when there's injustice, we all hate to see injustice, right? I mean, I gave the example a couple of weeks ago that if Lucille got up and slapped Darlene and I told Lucille, Lucille, it's okay, I forgive you, that's great for Lucille, not great for Darlene. It's like, where's the justice? Right? And God is not going like, to just throw out injustice. He's like, no, I've got you. And so there is this conflict. There's this tension. That's why when you're reading the Bible, there's always this tension of like, how is God going to act? How is God going to treat people? Is it going to be love? Is it mercy? Why is there justice sometimes? Why is there grace and mercy to others? Why? Because God is looking at people and he loves them and he cares about them. They're made in his image, but they're fallen from his image. And he wants them to all experience his love. But people have this incredible freedom to also reject it. But all of this goodness of God is what passes down throughout the story of Scripture until we encounter the person of Jesus who is himself God. He is the embodiment. He is the physical picture and person of God the Creator. He is God the Creator, right? John 1.1. 1, 1. And that's why it says this in 2 Corinthians amongst many verses in the New Testament. For God made Christ who never sinned, meaning he could bask in the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God without any consequence whatsoever, always rest in the goodness of God, no fear of judgment or even needing justice, never sinned to be the offering for our sin. Remember that atonement offering, that lamb that gets his throat slit, that dove that gets cut in half for sin, right? He becomes the offering for our sin. He becomes the covering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ so that you can rest in the goodness of God and not have to fear it. That you can rest in the goodness of what God has done because it is the justice has been accomplished. Jesus has taken the punishment, the justice for all of our sin upon himself so that you can be at peace, that you can rest in God's goodness, in His presence, that you can draw near to Him without fear. That's why we can come back to this. The temple was a house of prayer. Remember that you're supposed to draw near to God into, but in the New Testament, where is the temple now? It's right here. It's every single one of you who have have committed, who have asked who have turned your life over to God through Jesus, through that sacrifice of His, has asked for forgiveness, have given yourself to Him, have turned over the control and authority of your life, has surrendered to His will, right? His Holy Spirit is what comes into our life. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means you are a house of prayer. Turn to your neighbor and just tell them, you are a house of prayer. Yes, you are. Everywhere you go, you're a house of prayer. Everywhere you are, you are a house of prayer. You have the ability to draw near to God because He is always there and prepared to draw near to you. How incredible is that? That we can draw near to Him and we can relax into that goodness of God, which means relax is a, is a tricky word, right? Because this isn't relax in your lazy boy, like comfortable relax. This is relax in what God has done and who God is. Not in the circumstantial sense of what's going on around us. It is in our relationship with him. Colossians 3.15 says this, And let the peace peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. So here's this picture that as we draw near to God, I love this, there says that you have the opportunity to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. But notice that little word, I was going to highlight it, I forgot to, let let it, as in it won't do it automatically. You won't make Christ and his peace the ruler of your heart automatically. It's a choice you have to make. You have to decide, I'm going to invite the peace of Christ to rule in my heart. Or your heart can stay filled with anxiety, worry, fear, anger, rage, desire, Whatever else is inside of our hearts, but he's saying, or you can let the peace of Christ come and rule. You can invite God to draw near to you because you want to draw near to him. And when that comes, you can say, and I'm going to submit to the rule of Christ in my heart. That's where I have to die to my sense of like, I have to control all my worries and my fears. If I'm not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, it's going to get even worse. Did you know that that's a thing? I mean, I know some of you do it, but did you know that's not just you? 
This is a whole thing that people do. Psychologically, it's one of the things that's been recognized that people do. We have this, this belief that says, if I'm not worried about things going wrong, those things will go wrong. But as long as I stay worried about them, they won't go wrong. You can call that superstition or you can call that a technique. Either way, it's the opposite of this. This is resting in the goodness of God says, I'm going to trust God with tomorrow. I'm going to trust him with my family. I'm going to trust him with my children. I'm going to trust him with my future. I'm going to trust him with my choices. I'm going to hand over the control of all my life to him and trust him. But how do we do that? How do we actually take a step in that direction? I'm glad that you guys all asked. We're going to do it through a prayer. One that I think many of you already know and have at least heard about for sure. But I want to challenge you to make this prayer a part of your prayer toolbox. To add to how you pray. To make this a new way to pray. To challenge yourself to, to understand that there's more to prayer than maybe you currently have. And it's to pray the serenity prayer as we call it. You could also call this a prayer of surrender too though. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Incredible words right there. God grant me the serenity, right? Serenity is peace. It's calm. It's a pause. It's a deep breath. It's to slow down. God grant me the pause, the deep breath, to slow down, the peace to accept the things I cannot change, to accept the things I'm not in control of. God, grant this to me because I need your help to do it. God, grant me this peace, this calm, this pause to accept. That is not a small thing to be able to accept something that I don't want to accept, that I don't like. This is where dying begins. When I come to the place where I am ready to ask God <coughs> to change something so deep inside of me that it's beyond habit, I've even been unconscious, maybe even doing it, but I know that it fundamentally something's got to change. I need God's help to accept the things that I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can, that there's a lot of things that I can do, right? I can change my behavior. I can change my thinking. Over time, my thinking and my behavior can change my emotions. My beliefs can change when I invest myself in knowing what is true as opposed to the, the story I've been told or I'm telling myself. But it takes the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. God wants to give us wisdom. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. I mean, those are Jesus' words right there. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own already. No need to get ahead of yourself. Doesn't mean you can't plan for tomorrow, just don't worry about it. Live one day at a time. Appreciate one day at a time. Be thankful for one day at a time. Enjoy one moment at a time because you aren't going to get this moment again. Accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. That peace isn't just calmness in when it's the Hebrew word peace. It means wholeness. It's a pathway of becoming a complete person, of being made in the image of God, of being all held together, of having everything that I need. Taking, as he did, he being Jesus, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. That's right back to accepting. Recognizing this is a sinful, this is a broken, this is a hurting, disastrous world. Accepting. Just as Jesus did, that I may have to suffer in this sinful world. I may have to deal with hardships in this sinful world. But as I do that, I can draw near to God. I can relax into the goodness of God. As Jesus did. 
trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. And because I'm on a theme today, I'd say you can even say dying to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. How amazing would it be to pray those words every day, but actually believe them, actually know them, feeling the power of what it is to draw near to God and finding that serenity, finding that peace, finding that happiness, finding that power to endure. You know, just pray, everybody prays. I mean, almost universally. I mean, many atheists haven't quite been able to even kick the habit of prayer. So it's just a true thing. We're wired for prayer. Everybody prays, but not everybody prays effectively, which is why so many of us have this weird relationship with prayer. Why we kind of give up on it in some ways and shapes and forms. Because God didn't come through and do some stuff that I thought he really should have. Because he's God and I'm not. And that's super hard. It gets super mysterious. It gets really frustrating at times. And it's easy to quit on him. But I want to challenge every single one of us to take that step to draw near to God. To understand it's not about what God might do, but to understand it's how I might experience him. How I might get to know him better. And so I want to challenge you to pray that prayer, the serenity prayer, every day this week. But don't just read it and don't just recite it. Pray it. Pray it like it's a prayer. Pray it like it's a request. Pray it like your life depends on it. And maybe don't pray the whole thing. Maybe you just pray the very first line. right? Maybe you just start right here with God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Maybe that's as far as you're going to get, but don't stop praying that until you understand what you're asking God to do. Until you hear God give you a response to what that means. Until you find a victory in your relationship with God and your relationship with this world by finding his power in prayer. And for many of you who pray this and other things all the time, I encourage you to this too, to take a next step and even share it. One of the most universally welcome spiritual conversations is simply the one based around, can I pray for you? Nine times out of ten, somebody will respond with yes. Now, they don't expect you to pray right then. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you can't because they said yes. Or to tell someone, you know, I'm learning something about prayer. Because everybody prays, so that's intriguing. To be spiritual is to be cool nowadays. So it's okay to be like, you know, I'm practicing something. I'm growing in something. I want to know God more. Pray this. Teach this. Pass it on to your kids, to your grandkids, to your great-grandkids, to your friends. Talk to a coworker, to a neighbor. Take what God is showing you and what you are learning and teach it to somebody else. This is what it means to make a disciple. It's what Jesus tells us to do. It's at the core and at the heart of his desire for you and for me is for us to both learn and draw near to him and to show and to teach others how to do the same because you are all little temples of God running around this world, making this world a little bit more like the kingdom of heaven. The more that we surrender our lives and our will to him. And each day, we may have to die a little bit more to ourselves to be more fully alive in and through Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you to draw nearer to you. You have given us so many gifts, so many opportunities, so many ways to encounter you, to know you, to follow you, to partner with you, to serve you, to just relax with you. Father, this week, give us no rest until we rest in your goodness. Until we come to you with our life, with our problems, with our sense of control, with our sense of failure, with our, our every desire. And just lay it before you so that you can tell us what is going to bring us life and what is going to bring us death. That 
we can hear your voice and your love as you say our names and just call us to yourselves to be with you, to bask in you, to be lifted up by you. Holy Spirit, turn our hearts the most inward, in-depth place of our life to see, to know, to hear, to understand the incredible goodness of you as God. To understand that there is nothing better in this world than when we have this world through you, in you, because of you. Lord Jesus, may we be reminded that you are the great example, but we can't follow your example without your help. So pour your grace and the reminder of our need for it into our laps. That we would know our victories are also your victories. And we're not doing this on our own. We're doing this because of what you've done and because of what you continue to do as our incredible atoning sacrifice. May we rest in you with great serenity, with life-changing peace, walk into this future that you have planned in happiness and in joy and in faithfulness and in gentleness with incredible patience and self-control that could only come from you. We come to you, Father, and we pray these things in the name of your Son because it's only through him we can approach your holy throne. Amen.